Hi guys, this chapter is going to be all about video games. We're going to talk a little bit about the history, some of the criticisms, and some of the trends. Are you ready? Here we go. Some of the criticisms, I mean, you've heard them all, right? We're going to talk about them in class and rebut many of them. Like I told you in um, an earlier lecture, I would... Hi everybody, we have moved out of my basement and we are now outside. Uh, right now we're talking about video games, that's the topic for this chapter. And it's weird because the book that we used to use didn't even say anything about video games, which is crazy because you can't talk about the media without talking about video game industry. It's enormous. It's enormous. So what are some criticisms? Well, we've all heard them, right? That it makes people unsocial, it makes them lazy, it makes them violent. And you know what? My response to those criticisms, and we'll talk about this in class, but people have been violent forever. You know, the Civil War was violent, and that was before video games. The Crusades were violent, and that was before video games. So you can't, I have trouble with people who blame video games for a lot of things because they don't, I feel like they don't understand them. Okay. So Bill Gates says the video game industry is bigger than Hollywood. How do you explain that? Well, you know, a game is usually about 60 bucks. And, um, we spend a lot more time with video games than we do with movies. At least we do in my house. So why should we study video games? Well, they're really super concentrated. They're luring people away from traditional media. Like I mentioned in the television lecture, I feel like the hours that we spend watching television content are actually going to decrease. Um, they're used and filled with advertising. They're global in that term convergence. They're played on almost every format. You can play on your laptop, you can play on your console, you can play on your tablet, you can play on your phone. So there's all these reasons that we should be studying video games. And if you're a video game design major, of course, this is right up your alley. So let's talk history. Um, one of the first games is called Baffle Ball. It only had one moving part. And when the ball went into the hole, you were done. The improvement came with contact because if you scored a certain score, the ball came back. So it was starting to give us that feeling of rewards. And Humpty Dumpty did a terrific job with this in 1947. There were six moving flippers and you earned replays. So if you think about it, the reward system is in the video game industry in a way that it doesn't exist anywhere else. And we love that as humans right? We can't even go to any retail establishment without them asking if we want to be a part of the rewards program. It's like, it's, it's contagious. So a little bit of more history. Uh, MIT is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They had a model railroad club. <laughs> and this guy named Steve Russell created a book, a game called Space War. And really, if you look at it, I think what it amounted to was asteroids. And Asteroids was one of the very, very first video games. This guy named Nolan Bushnell was addicted to space war, and he developed a coin-operated version of it, and so he started the company called Atari. That was in 1972. Now, I have to give you a little background about um, my eighth grade year. I grew up in Edwardsville, Illinois, and on Friday nights, my friends and I would go to Pantera's, and we would go to the arcade, and we played asteroids, we played Galaga, we played Space, Inva Space Invaders, and we played Miss Pac-Man. Uh, that's all we did. And it was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. This is from your book. This talks about different types of video games. And I wonder if you are surprised by any of this. And we'll talk about it in class. Um, the other, I'm assuming, is word games, because that's what I play mainly now word games and puzzles, but I don't see that anywhere. And I'd also be curious about the difference between shooter games and fighting games, like maybe fighting is like MMA or something. In class, there's going to be, the competition is going to be um, a team kahoot on video game trivia. So get excited. So you're basically looking at my childhood right now. We've got Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Frogger, Miss Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and Galaga. I know, we were really high-tech in the 80s. <laughs> really high-tech. All right, so the first person first, first person shooter game was Doom. And this was the first time that all the action was seen through the eyes of the shooter. And remember, back then, really the only place you could play was on a computer or a big standing, freestanding thing in an arcade. So who plays video games? Everybody. The average player is 30. 
Almost half of gamers are female. Gamers spend 6.8 hours per week average. At my house, it's probably 80 hours. <laughs> probably a lot higher than that. But you know what? This debunks the stereotype that people have about gamers, right? Is that they're creepy guys that live in their mom's basement. It's not true. And I'm sure there are some, but it's certainly not all of them. Extra games is how the video game industry responded to the criticism that they caused obesity. So here we've got the DDR and who can forget the Wii. Remember when the Wii was such a big deal? Because we were actually moving. Uh, we had the Xbox Connect at our house for a while and this was how the industry responded to the criticism that they caused obesity. Most games are made by third-party publishers. EA is the biggest and the reason is that licenses are super costly. If you think about like Madden 21, what EA would have to pay the NFL in order to use all the images, all the likenesses, all the logos, all the colors, it costs a fortune. So it's really difficult to get into that industry unless you have a lot of money or you get hired by EA. And of course there's the MMORPGs. These, I don't know, if, are these as big as they used to be? You'll have to tell me. I never really got into these, but these are the big ones. Uh, we did play Sims a lot in our house at one point. Now, there's a lot of advertising within the games. And think of video game advertising in the same way that you think of magazine advertisements. Very, very niche, very narrow casted. Because, for example, the audience that's playing Grand Theft Auto is going to be much different than the audience that's playing Roller Coaster Tycoon. And while you're playing, I want you to really notice ads within video games. Because there was an article in Wired last year that said they didn't think that ads within video games are very effective. And I'd, I'm curious to hear what you all think. There's also a term called advert gaming. And that is when a brand actually becomes the game. So it's half advertisement, but it's also a game. And this is super, super common. Uh, most, if you check the back of most cereal boxes, at least sugar cereal boxes, you're gonna see ads for the game with the Trix Rabbit or Tony the Tiger. And it's a way to build um, a brand relationship with a kid at a young age. It's pretty smart, really. Advocacy gaming is also mentioned in your book, and I knew nothing about this, that um, the gov our government actually created a video game to send to people in Africa to learn about HIV awareness. Okay, so then I was thinking, what all did we learn playing Zoo Tycoon? Well, I remember one time taking my kids to the, uh, to the zoo and my youngest saying, Mom, that habitat is totally wrong for the hyena. Well, how did he know that? It's not like I would have ever said, you know, study the habitats of hyenas, but he knew from playing Zoo Tycoon. So I think that there's a way, in fact, there's research that shows that it's a lot easier to learn something if you're having a good time if it's set up as something fun. And advocacy gaming plays into that, where they can teach you about certain issues while you're having a good time. So, are video games addictive? Yes, and you know, I do a lot of workshops for parent groups and stuff, and it never fails. There's a mom, I mean, not as much as like last year, but there's usually somebody freaked out about Fortnite. Um, but, oh, I've, I've gotten this email a lot too. Professor, can you come to our school and get kids away from Fortnite? <laughs> no, no, I can't. Um, how about we try it this way? Why don't we show the kids how Fortnite is created to be addictive? And then they can make their own decisions. So here's what I discovered. The makers of Fortnite thought to themselves, what game can we study that even middle-aged people got addicted to so that we can figure out how to make Fortnite as addictive as possible? And they studied Candy Crush. So two terms that I want you to know, interest curve and lose by a little. The interest curve means that in gaming, sometimes, especially like in puzzle and word games, you get to a certain plateau and every single level is the same, right? There's no interest curve there. Like I played Wordscapes for months, but then I just got bored because there was no interest curve, okay? An interest curve means that every level is different and the, the difficulty changes, it keeps your curiosity going. So you're more likely to continue to play. The idea called lose by a little is that each time you lose, 
you are so close to winning that you think, well, next time, I'm, I'm just going to play one more time. And next time I bet I win. Does that sound familiar? Because that's what I do. <laughs> Yeah, this whole idea, lose by a little, it just keeps you interested enough so that you keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. So I will never tell a kid, like a middle school kid, not to play video games. But I will talk to them about how the games are designed to be so addictive. Are video games good for you? Guess what? This author, Steven Johnson, says yes. He wrote a really great book. It's called Everything Bad is Good for You. And what he says is that we don't give video games enough credit for the cognitive abilities that are required. We have to pay attention. We have to remember. We have to follow threads. We have to solve puzzles. And he says that video games hone different skills than reading. And I think that that's absolutely true. Like I see my, my sons working together and collaborating and solving puzzles, etc., in when they're in a gaming situation. And so this brings me to, um, Sim City. We played this, oh gosh, religiously when my boys were in middle school. And this was really interesting because my middle son absolutely did not like social studies at all. But when he played this game, he would say things like, mom, I managed to get my mayor rating up while my taxes were still decent. And I didn't want to break his heart and say, you know, you're learning social studies. <laughs> But that's exactly what he was doing, right? And this goes back to the whole idea that while we're having fun and relaxed in a fun gaming atmosphere, we're more likely to learn things. And I think that that's totally true. So there's a real trend in K-12 education now called the gamification of education, where instead of just lecturing about geometry, is there a way you can turn geometry into a game? Or something like that. And if you all could figure out how to do that, you'll make a fortune because it's really big now. Really big. So more from Steven Johnson. Games force us to make decisions. You learn as explorer as you go and you have to coordinate puzzles in a sequential way. So how is that different than when I read um, Pride and Prejudice from Jane Austen? Every time I read it, it's exactly the same. It is a linear story written by someone else and I know exactly how it's going to end because it never changes. But my oldest has played Red Dead. What's the latest Red Dead? I don't even remember. Two? He's played that several times differently every time. So it's nonlinear. So nonlinear storytelling is so much more interesting than linear. And in many cases, it's a storyline that you are choosing for yourself in an environment that you have created yourself. So we'll talk more about video games when we get to class. But this is the stuff that I wanted you to know. All right. Goodbye from my deck.